All right, and we're going to go live. Awesome. All right, welcome everyone. I'm Heather Manival. I'm the Vice President of Advancement with the York County History Center. I welcome you for being here today and thank you for joining us for our first virtual lunch and learn on our planned giving topics. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to make a few comments and to do a couple of housekeeping items. So I know that we have a few folks in our audience who are longtime supporters and members. And we also have a few individuals that are a little bit newer to the History Center. So I invite everyone at some point today to take a few minutes to look at our website at www.yorkhistorycenter.org uh, to learn more about our organization and what we're doing. And even for you longtime supporters, we have a wealth of new programming with our virtual offerings uh, that you might not have heard about. So check us out online. Uh, Tim is welcoming uh, any questions that you might have throughout the presentation. And if you're new to Zoom, if you look at the bottom of your page, you'll see that there's a chat feature. If you click that button, you can use the chat box to submit a question, and I will hold the questions until the end uh, for Q&A. So feel free to ask any questions that you might have using that chat feature, um, and I'll be happy to help. Uh, I also, before I turn it over to Tim, would like to say thank you to him. So if you don't know Tim, you will by the end of this. Uh, in addition to being the principal at Harvest Rock Advisors, he's also a member of our board of directors, and of the Advancement Committee, and Tim has been a valuable resource. Uh, the CARES Act has been uh, a, a challenge to, to really thoroughly understand. I certainly don't, and I'm grateful to have him. Um, I've been grateful to have Tim throughout this, this, whole, um, this whole time, in this challenging time, um, and, and I'm just thrilled that he's offered to provide some insight to everyone. So with that said, I am going to turn it over to Tim. Great. Heather, thank you, and the check's in the mail. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time on a beautiful summer's day to, to learn about charitable giving. That says a lot about you, by the way. Um, the good news for you um, is that Heather told me that I have to get at least A minus grade on my perform presentation today before I'm allowed to go play golf. So I'm hyper focused to do a good job and at least bring my A minus game today. And as you can see, I'm already dressed and ready for permission to tee off. Uh, and yes, those pictures are of me. Um, I had a lot of, I've had a lot of fun with them with our clients and, and friends of mine since my wife took these pictures uh, earlier this month. This is me right before and right after my first haircut in three and a half months. I'm about ready for another one. Um, my wife said if she had known that I had been less grouchy with getting just a haircut, she would have cut it herself many weeks prior. Um, so to add to Heather's introductory comments, uh, I'm a passionate supporter of the History Center. I'm not a York native, uh, but I've lived here for nearly 30 years and it's my adopted hometown. I'm also a certifiable history geek. Um, and I would submit that acre for acre. More, is hap more history has happened in little York County, Pennsylvania than any other place in the country. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of successful people um, in the past who are philanthropic. I like and respect philanthropic people who want to give back and support their causes and their community. Uh, so they say you're an expert on a topic if you travel at least 30 miles to speak about it. So I failed that test today, um, but I do specialize in, in, in charitable giving and charitable planning in our practice. So I'm happy to share some planning ideas today with you. Um, so my goal is to leave you with, um, with a couple of ahas or um, I didn't know that type moments. So we're, the agenda, uh-oh. We back? Yeah. Yeah, so here's the agenda. I'm going to talk about the challenges that are facing non for profits today in this COVID crisis environment that we're, uh, we're in. I want to review both the existing charitable tax law, give you an overview, but also, as Heather mentioned, talk about the CARES Act 
and what that means and the changes in charitable tax law that are included in it. And then I wanna share some planning, charitable planning concepts and opportunities for you to mull over that have presented themselves um, both with the CARES Act and just uh, in the current environment that we're in. Um, I saw this last week. I thought this little meme just summed up 2020 perfectly. Um, what we've been living through this year, unless of course you um, have a, a, a taste for this dastardly combination. Um, COVID pandemic has been a war by a different name. And I think you know the massive policy responses that we've seen both with the government and, and the Fed Reserve um, have been warlike. Um, and it really started with new legislation called the CARES Act, which passed in late March. And we'll delve into that in a few minutes. Um, but just know that there's been stimulus passed since then, and there's a lot more stimulus coming. They're working on a fairly large bill right now. Well, I got out of seminar mode. I apologize. Here we go. Now I'm back on track. Um, but the reality is that non for profits and charities are really having a tough time of it right now, especially in terms of generating revenue from their traditional channels and sources. Fee-based programs have been canceled. Uh, membership roles are falling. Government funding has been curtailed. Grants are getting even more competitive. And other fundraising endeav endeavors in general are hamstrung in this environment. It's a true cash inflow problem for not-for-profits. You know, fortunately, the History Center has an excellent leadership, has had excellent leadership both at the management and board level and a really strong foundation in the community of support. But you know, like other organizations, they're, you know, they're challenged in, the, in these days like, um, as well. And frankly, one of the unique challenges for a non-for-profit in this pandemic mode is the optics of asking for financial support from their advocates in a time of crisis. You have to be really careful about how they frame the ask and avoid sending mixed, mixed messages. It's really tricky. This was a poll that was done recently. I thought it was interesting. I thought I'd share it with you. And uh, Fidelity went out and asked philanthropic minded folks you know, about how they're thinking about philanthropy these days in response to the pandemic and how the situation could affect you know, their giving behaviors. Um, sort of a good news, bad news propositions from a perspective of a nonprofit. As you can see here, 25% um, of the donors plan to increase donations. 54% plan to at least maintain their giving levels. That's the positive. I guess we did the math. That suggests that 21% plan on reducing or perhaps eliminating their giving. Um, so the question is going to be whether the 25% that are willing and able to step up their giving will offset the 21% that don't. Um, Non-for-profits are also fending off another problem um, that arose in 2018. Um, and some of you may be familiar with this, but there was a tax law change that began in 2018. And I'll try to keep this um, simple, not, not technical, where um, the standard deduction that folks could take off the return was doubled, whether you're married or single. And the effect of that was to, for a lot of people, it eliminated their ability to itemize deductions, which means they couldn't take a charitable tax deduction particularly for those late year checks they would write to their favorite non-for-profits to get a tax benefit. So when that passed and became effective in 2018, there was a lot of concern in the non-for-profit world that smaller gifts would drop and that's exactly what they uh, have seen in 2018 and 2019. Um, so to summarize, non-for-profits are facing a lot of stiff headwinds and they really need um, the help of, you know, the private support more than ever. Uh, Heather, uh, just an aside, Heather um, had shared with uh, leaders of the organization, uh, the board and the committee that um, the History Center was the recipient, got news of receiving a nice grant uh, this week. It was exciting news, but struck me was how competitive she indicated that grant process was. So everyone's out looking to get resources now, and I guess even the grant world is is intense. So it's just a very, very difficult time for not-for-profits and they need all the support they can get from their, from their advocates. All right, so let's transition over and, and look at this CARES Act thing that you've been hearing about. 
Um, again, I, I'm referred to it as a war spending bill. I truly believe that. We are in a war of a different type. And the government is certainly throwing rescue money at it. This particular act passed in late March, uh, again, $2 trillion. Um, and there's something in the act for, for most everybody, a lot of goodies, as I'm calling it. Uh, how we're going to pay for all this money, by the way, is a topic for a different seminar. Um, but I would submit that a lot of these things that were included were necessary, right? We um, had a government force shutdown. And so they had to step up with some with appropriate policy response. But you know, for the first and foremost, cash, right? Hope everyone here got their stimulus check. Um, the only reason you wouldn't is if you can fog a mirror, although I just heard this week a couple billion went out to dead people. Um, but if you fog a mirror and didn't fail an income test, you should be getting a check for 1200 bucks this year. For dependents, it's a little less. Um, in finishing that thought, if you have not received your check yet, don't fret. The IRS was already understaffed and they went down to a skeleton crew here with COVID. So they've really struggled to process the 20, 2019 tax returns and, and refunds, let alone stimulus checks for hundreds of millions of people. This is something a lot, a lot of people aren't aware of. So if you do not get your check this year and you were eligible, you'll be able to take that uh, stimulus credit against your 2020 tax bill or get a cash refund when you file your return come 2020. Um, but yeah, just some, some of the highlights here. There's more to this, but I picked, out the, um, I picked out my favorites. The tax return deadline pushed out to July 15th. I should probably get started on my own taxes. Nothing like sitting around looking through a shoebox of receipts on July 4th, but that'll be my project. Uh, very generous federal unemployment benefits. In some cases, it, um, it paid to be on unemployment better than your, than your compensation. That's all coming to an end here in August, it looks like. Um, almost a trillion dollars worth of forgivable small business loans uh, to help keep folks on payroll. Nonprofits could avail themselves to that as well. Um, I highlighted the next one. No IRA required minimum distributions for 2020. Um, that's... Um, I don't know if any folks here fall in that category, but RMD um, is a grouchy term for a lot of folks who don't want or need that income yet have to pay tax on it. So that's been suspended. Um, another news flash in that regard, just this week, the IRS announced uh, folks who took out their RMD early in the year before the law was passed, uh, the way the law was originally written, they, they were out of luck, but they changed that. If you want to pay back your RMD, you can and unwind the transaction. That was just announced this week. And then um, here's one for you. You're allowed to take $100,000 out of your IRA or 401k uh, without any penalty, no matter your age, and no taxes for three years. If you don't pay it back in three years, you would have to pay tax, but no penalties. Boy, that's fraught with all kinds of issues, right? Try rating your retirement plans. So unless you were, unless in dire straits, that um, that may not be a good idea, but I wanted to make you aware of it. And then a bunch of others, but I really want to uh, really focus today on some of the charitable giving incentives that were included in the act. So let's talk about that. So we'll start with small ball here. Um, a $300 tax deduction for non-itemizing taxpayers, which is 90% of the U.S. population now because of the change I, I alluded to earlier. And that's $600 if you're married if you make a charitable cash gift to a non-for-profit. Um, non-profits have long advocated for this, you know, above the line deduction. Um, they would just like to see the number larger, and that may happen in a future tax bill. We'll have to wait and see. Um, the last bullet point is a nice wrinkle too. Uh, a charitable deduction for contributions of food by a trade or business or a distributor to a food bank, what have you. That's been increased to 25% for 20 to encourage um, food bank contributions. But the one I really like to, to focus on today is this uh, one I put in yellow. It's the 100% tax deduction for cash charitable gifts in 2020 only um, for, the, for you itemizers, itemizers out there. And let me explain why. But before I get into uh, that, those gritty, gritty details, let me rule out what isn't eligible for the 100% deduction? What type of charitable giving 
doesn't get the 100% deduction rule for 2020. Um, so a cash contribution to a donor advised fund is still subject to a 60% deduction rate, and we'll define what those percentages mean in a second. Um, but 60% of your gross income could be deducted for cash gifts to a donor advised fund. Charitable gifts to of any appreciated assets of any type um, are still limited to 30% of your income, as well are gifts to charitable trusts. Now, what's interesting is um, cash gifts to charitable gift annuities um, appear to be eligible. I use the word appear with quotation marks because the language in the law was very vague and several analysts are interpreting it to mean they could get, it would be eligible for the 100% deduction, but that's an interpretation. So we'd encourage you to talk to your tax advisor before proceeding with making a cash funded charitable gift annuity contract this year. Um, and another aside, because the, this particular vehicle is becoming more and more popular, um, as I said, particularly for those grumpy IRA uh, holders who are of age and take an RMD, and they don't need the money, they don't want the money, yet they're getting taxed for those distributions. Several years ago, uh, we had the advent of what's called a Qualified Charitable Deduction, QCD. And basically how that works is uh, the, the IRA holder can make a direct gift from their IRA custodial account right to non-for-profits of their choice. And the amount of that gift not only skips their tax return completely, it also satisfies their IRA requirement minimum distribution for that year. And the rules are there. It's age 70 and a half uh, and limited to 100,000 per donor per year. Um, the QCD is still available in 20 but a lot of the wind has been taken out of its sales because there is no RMD requirement this year, right? So that's really where this becomes, um, I think, most, of, most advantageous and appealing to folks who are in RMD mode. By the way, um, before COVID, there was an RMD relief starting this year with tax law passed last December, where you could, uh, if you were, had not reached, um, age 70 and a half, you can start taking your RMD at age 72. Now that's all been suspended for at least another year. We'll see what happens in 2021. Um, okay, so let's start drilling down into this 100% deduction rule, now that we rolled out what's not eligible. Um, so just to give you a little perspective, uh, per the SECURE Act, that's the name of the law from last year, ca charitable cash gifts were given a little bit of a boost. Um, you were able, the old rule was a 50% deduction of your gross income. They bumped it up to 60%. COVID's now made that 100. And when I say income, let me define it for you. It's important. AGI is an acronym for adjusted gross income. And I like to tell our clients, that's sort of the, uh, your income at the bottom of the first page of your tax return uh, before any deductions are considered. And so that has long been a uh, sort of a, uh, um, a numerator from which to determine uh, how much charitable deductions are allowed and if you're not allowed to take all of it in that year, then um, the old rules and the new rules were the same. You can carry that forward for five uh, future tax years, okay? So why is it such a big deal? Why do I get so excited, um, besides being a geek, um, that this 100% charitable tax rule, why is it such a big deal? Uh, let, me, let me share a couple ideas. And again, I wanna keep this high level today. Um, and just again, give you a couple, um, that's interesting um, thought takeaways. And the first of which is, is very simple, probably the most straightforward is this idea of tax bracket management. You know, here we have a, a federal system where, you know, you're in, basically the more income you report, you pay a higher rate on it, right? We call it a graduated tax system. And so as you, the, the, the planning opportunity isn't to take your tax bill to zero. Sorry, folks. The idea is to try to manage around what's the tax rate on the next dollar, right? The last dollar in. So the idea then is to try to reduce if those if those tax dollars are in very high brackets, why not use charitable cash gifts, for instance, to reduce income out of that bracket dollar for dollar? You know, in the past you could only do it 50, 60 percent of a dollar. So it was sort of um, inefficient. Now we have this one year maximum efficient tax deduction where if we write a cash check to charity or non-for-profit, 
we got the ability to take that equal amount of income out of higher brackets. And so the deduction becomes more valuable. In a similar vein, if you look at the last bullet point, as I said earlier, one of the big bummers um, for non-for-profits has been this uh, loss of the standard deduction. Well, for a lot of people, uh, they were, may have, they've lost the ability to itemize their tax deductions. And when I say that, that would include uh, not only charitable gifts, but also mortgage interest and state and local taxes and medical expenses in some situations. So the fact this year, if, we're, um, if we wrote a large enough cash gift with a 100% deduction, that may stack on top of our other lost deductions and get above our standard deduction and actually lead to a larger write-off and a larger tax break. So the ability to maybe force itemization, if that term makes sense, um, and get above the standard deduction and take a larger tax break. The third bullet point is just, I wanna highlight if anyone here have uh, investors and have opened your March or late, late statements this year, you know it's been inside of a bummer. Investments have taken a real hit. Um, and if you own investments that are not in an IRA or a Roth or 401k, either joint or taxable, we call them, uh, you likely have seen those, um, the, the values drop. And in some cases, maybe they've dropped below what you paid for them. We haven't had this conversation in a long time where you actually could look to what we call harvest losses or go in and sell an investment that's now worth less than you paid for it. And the tax code allows you to take a $1,500 deduction against any gross income, 3,000 if you're married, against any kind of income for any investment losses. And the rest then gets carried forward to use against future gains. So those, we call them deferred tax assets, can be very valuable to help reposition portfolio. So I just wanna make you aware we're in a unique period right now, sort of making lemon out of lemonade or lemonade out of lemon, excuse me, um, to go out and harvest those losses while investments might be down before they, before they rally. And then I saved the, um, the last one, um, or the second one for last for a reason. This is one I get really enthused about, uh, is the Roth IRA conversion. I'm a big fan of the Roth um, IRA, and a Roth structure means that the, any future growth or income isn't taxed, and that's really the power of it. Um, if we were in another room, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you think if tax rates are going to be going up in the future. Um, and I would, well, if you weren't raising your hand, I would encourage you to, because no matter who wins the election, we're going to be looking at higher future federal income uh, tax rates to pay for this spending. And that makes the Roth accounts more valuable, right? If you don't have to pay tax and higher rates. So the Roth conversion has been popular, and I think it's going to become even more popular this year. And this is where this 100% deduction gets kind of, um, I think, very um, compelling, is that if we end up writing a, whatever cash gift that we write to a for-profit this year, we can take a 100% deduction. That amount then could equal a dollar-for-dollar dollar Roth conversion offset with no tax paid. When we talk about Roth conversion with our clients, they get excited about it. And so I bring to their attention, they're going to have to pay income tax in the year of conversion. That sort of takes all the fun out of the conversation. And that's where now bringing in 100% write-offs takes that issue off of the table. So that is the CARES Act in 10 minutes. Um, as you can see, there's windows of opportunity for you to uh, work with your tax advisor and to think about your charitable giving this year and take advantage of uh, of an opportunity that is likely to uh, disappear come January of 2021. But why I still have you, sort of the third leg of the stool today, I really want to talk about uh, some other charitable planning techniques that are available to you, sort of give you an update on them and make sure you have them in your, in your uh, radar as you look to um, complete your, your charitable giving goals here, well, for this year and beyond. Um, and I like to refer to these four as charity with a string. Because you think about a cash gift, right? There's a lot of benefits that come from you making a gift to charity. Um, certainly, you feel good about supporting favorite causes. You get the tax breaks we've talked about. But the reality is that that money's gone, right? It's out of your, um, it's out of your checkbook. It's out of your estate. There's several different charitable techniques where, again, we can actually get, um, achieve all those goals, but also retain a financial interest. 
uh, whether lifetime, um, whether income now or later, but not both. Um, so let me go through a couple of these really quickly. I just want to again, uh, bring them to your attention. And, and I really I do want to focus on the one I've highlighted and really introduce you to what's called the Charitable Pooled Income Trust. But let me spend, just make a couple of comments on these other three. Uh, a lot of you may be familiar with the Charitable Gift Annuity. Um, been around a long time, a really um, effective device to avoid, um, well, actually to generate a tax deduction, but also generate a lifetime income stream, either individual or joint. So it can fit nicely inside a retirement income plan in addition to satisfying charitable goals. Um, gift annuities, as we talked about earlier, may be available for a cash, 100% deduction if they're funded in cash, but typically they're funded with appreciated assets. They're often done with you know, stocks that have, um, have grown in value and you can donate the shares into a gift annuity and pay income tax on that over your lifetime. It really has some tax advantages. Um, the problem we have now with gift annuities are extremely low rates. Um, as you probably noticed, interest rates have been low. They've gone to near zero here since the COVID crisis. And so um, I saw just last week, I think, where the Council of Gift Annuities, which is a, an agency that helps non-for-profits set their payout rates on annuities, are reducing that rate uh, by about 30% come July. So in, with low interest rates, charitable gift annuities tend to struggle to pay out, uh, the income payouts drop. And, and the, the, uh, it also uh, there's an impact on the deduction based on the present value calculation. You have a similar problem with a charitable remainder trust. Charitable remainder trusts are used for larger dollars. You really need to go out and have a, an attorney draft your own trust. And there is that cost plus the administrative cost. So they tend to be larger dollar um, gifts. Um, but the nice thing is they pay a lifetime joint income. And then at the end of the death of the, of the income beneficiary, the second one, or the last one, I should say, what's left in the trust goes to charities of their choice. Low interest rates really hurt the deductibility, the charitable deduction you get up front for setting up a trust and further reasons are beyond the scope of today. Um, and then conversely, the charitable lead trust, by the way, we like all of these tools. We do a lot of work with remainder and lead trust. And the lead trust uh, sort of works conversely with the remainder trust, they love low interest rates. And so the lead trust, again, larger dollar gifts, they tend to be folks that maybe had a windfall or they sold some real estate or had come into a meaningful amount of income. They set up their own trust, and then that trust makes payments out annually to the charities of their choice. But when the trust term ends, that money then what's left comes back to the donor, or better yet, goes out to their family members outside of their estate. So that's the three of the four sort of charity vehicles with a string, but I really want to focus a little bit on this. Uh, it's really an old strategy that's got to come back with it, has a new twist. It's really become more popular, the charitable pooled income trust. And sort of view the charitable income trust folks as sort of a cross between a gift annuity and a donor advised fund. And some companies have come in and again, they've modernized it, I would say. And now they, um, in this environment, they offer um, higher income distributions than a gift annuity, for example, higher charitable tax deductions than gift annuities and charitable remainder trusts. I'm not sure why you would do this, but you can add up to 10 lifetime beneficiaries. But what I really like about it is the fact that the donor gets to pick the charities as the remainder beneficiaries. That's a key distinction with the gift annuity. Works very much like a trust. Yeah, this is not a separate trust. It's a pooled trust. So monies go into this trust vehicle, um, low minimums, and no cost to set up. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with the Lewis Miller Society with this History Center. It's our, our group of um, advocates that have um, included the History Center in their estate plans. And we view this as just sort of a wonderful uh, solution for that, um, for that group of our advocates to include the History Center in, uh, in their legacy planning. So try just to, hopefully I stayed out of the details. Hopefully I stay away from too much jargon. Um, but it's important that I make this point here that we covered a lot there, a lot of important topics, a lot of giving topics that are quite uh, complicated. So I think it's just critical for you, for you here, me to tell you that you really need to work with your tax advisor before making any material sudden tax move. 
tens of thousands of pages in the tax code. We added you know, a few thousand more with this CARES Act. Be sure, this is not the area to do it yourself. So be sure to speak to your professional tax pro or tax advisor before making any um, material moves regarding these things we've talked about today. So, hope you found this helpful. Hope you found um, something you can take away and, and continue your conversations with family members, non for profits, your favorites, and also your, your professionals. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Heather and see if there's any questions or comments that you'd like to, like to share. Yeah, I'm really happy to come back now that you've gotten the heavy lifting and hard part out of the way, Tim. So thank you very much. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one I will handle because it's I can actually have the expertise to answer this one. So someone on the in the audience is wondering if we could get a copy of the slides. Um, yes, absolutely. So uh, Tim has shared with me the slide deck and we've been recording this presentation. So I will make sure everyone gets a copy of the slides and the presentation after this, um, probably sometime this afternoon, you'll get an email from me with that, with that content. Um, I know I'll, I'll probably listen again. There is a lot of good information in here, Tim. Um, the other questions I can't answer. So Tim, the <laughs> question <laughs> I wouldn't even try is, um, what if my tax person is unfamiliar with these charitable vehicles? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Um, and by the way, we, we encounter that quite often, to be honest with you. It's, um, um, yeah, that's a good one. So I guess what I would encourage you to do, first of all, use your resources here, right? Um, Heather, and um, I'm certainly available to answer questions. Um, and, you know, we, we see this a lot in our practice, so I have to very tactfully um, educate, familiarize, what's the right word? Um, a lot of tax parishioners, and we're happy to do that, right? It's part of what we should be doing, but it's also, is a resource that the History Center can help bring their practitioners so we can reach out to them, communicate with them, and explain the pitfalls, right? Everything, there's nothing perfect. So we'd wanna you know, lay out um, the benefits, but also any uh, potential pitfalls that, that might exist. So we can be a resource in that regard. I say center, um, the center can be a resource. Great, and I have two questions that are similar, so I'll combine them. Um, Tim, do you think there's an appetite for the government to offer this again next year or for these CARES Act provisions to become permanent? Wow, that's a great question. I've been, I've been thinking a month at a time ahead, <laughs> or probably fiscal or calendar year ahead. But yeah, I mean, um, it's been very dynamic. I mean, it was, it was amazing how quickly they put this act together, this CARES Act. I mean, we were what, February, COVID was still, you know, a concept and by a month later we got a two trillion dollar act passed and as you can imagine because of that there were a lot of um uh i need a lot of cleanup <laughs> so yeah it's really interesting to watch what happens because yeah a lot of these things particularly um as i mentioned i call it the small ball but the ability to take universal make universal gifts to non-for-profits uh whether whether no matter what your itemization status is right that would be nice be nice if it wasn't just $600, right? You, get, you can make a meaningful gift to the center and take a several thousand dollar write-off, not have to itemize. You could see something like that because I said earlier, not-for-profits need assistance, right? It wasn't their fault that we can't have museum visitors. And so I think you might see more of that. You could see even more charitable, if not made permanent, even more uh, charitable giving incentives in future legislation. We'll just have to watch and see. It's a, it's a really good question. All right, and I have one more. Um, and in terms of plan giving, um, how do I make sure the History Center gets the money when I'm gone? Yeah, good questions. Um, well, the easy way is to put it in your will, right? Change your will document if you have a trust instead of a will or in combination, you'd wanna make sure that we're uh, that the center is named in that document. And, um, but as we talked about, for instance, with the pooled income trust, that's sort of a will alternative. So that money that's, or, and um, we really, gift annuities are tricky for us, right? Because we don't offer gift annuities. I should have said that earlier. Um, so the problem with the gift annuity is whoever the charity that sponsors it gets that money. Um, a donor advised fund, uh, which we didn't spend a lot of time on today, but I really like donor advised funds because then you can sprinkle 
out gifts that are to charities in the center that's named in that um, named in that in that vehicle, but also during a lifetime and or at death. And then lastly, we mentioned that uh, whether charitable remainder trust, lead trust, or the pooled income trust, actually naming them as the ultimate remainder beneficiary. Um, so yeah, there's no guarantees, but actually there's certain vehicles where you can actually put that in writing in your legal documents would, would increase the likelihood that money's gonna end up here or at the center. Great, and that is all of the questions that we have. Um, I would like to remind everyone on here that uh, to Tim's point, you can always reach out to us as you're um, reviewing the slide or maybe if you decide to rewatch the presentation. Um, my email address is hmanable, M-A-N-E, V as in Victor, A-L, at yorkhistorycenter.org. So you can feel free to send me an email if you have any questions um, and I'll make sure to pass that along to Tim. Um, and thank you so much for being here with us today. Tim, do you have any final remarks? Yeah, just a couple. Um, I think, Heather, are we planning to do another one of these in the fall? Yes, we are hopeful to, um, to host a, a few different um, topics or webinars on charitable giving, on planned giving. Um, so if you have ideas, if there's something in particular that anyone in this audience or anyone that you're talking to um, who's involved with the History Center, you think you would like us to feature the topic, we love that, that feedback so we know what you'd like to hear from us. Yeah, I almost didn't show this important slide, Heather. I apologize. I got stuck. Um, here's our contact information, um, and obviously it'll be in the uh, PowerPoint and the, uh, the presentation Heather will send out to you. But thank you for your time. Please, everyone, stay safe and have a great summer. And Heather, did I earn my golf round or not? You can go golf now. All right, cool. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.